More than 10 years ago, I used to be a um, PhD student uh, in this lab. I worked with Hervé Close, who you've met on Saturday. Very nice guy. Um, during uh, my PhD thesis, I, well, most of my work was dedicated to developing an approach for retrieving some information on phytoplankton community composition and phytoplankton biomass vertical distribution using ocean, satellite ocean color observations. Uh, I also worked on the variability of photophysiological properties of phytoplankton depending on phytoplankton community structure in view of improving the parameterization of bioptical primary production models. Um, then I moved for a quite long postdoc um, at Scripps in San Diego, where I worked with Darius Tramsky, with who you, you also know. Um, so I stayed five years, so I worked on several projects there. Uh, one of them, I think he showed you some of the results. One of them was dedicated to design a lab experiment um, during which we try to monitor the changes in optical properties in response to, to the infection of a culture of bacteria with viruses. And then we were funded to work on another project which built upon the work that I, I developed during my PhD. And um, in the context of the project, we were able to propose estimates uh, at the global scale of phytoplankton group specific primary production rate, which was kind of nice. Um, so that was about it. So today we're going to work to um, we're going to talk about the retrieval of uh, phytoplankton community composition. I'm going to focus on uh, satellite ocean color uh, te base techniques. Okay, so that was my mini CV. <laughs> Um, the outline of the talks. Well, I will start by trying to convince you of the importance of uh, phytoplankton community structures in biogeochemical study. If you have something to remind, to recall from this lecture, it will be this. Phytoplankton diversity is super important. Um, I will then um, try to give you a little background on PF um, on phytoplankton. Uh, groups, which we often refer to as phytoplankton functional types. I will try to give you some sort of definition later on. Uh, so we'll see how they're distributed in open ocean waters. We'll see uh, if how they correlate with optical properties. So basically, you've seen all this through more concept approach uh, during the previous lectures, probably from Colin, from Darius, maybe from Zhongping too. So we will see that as uh, we'll review this material through examples uh, from cruise data. And then, as you know, we will do our small group discussion. So I will, uh, I will tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, then I will say a quick word about how the international community has structured around different projects related to, um, to the retrieval of information on phytoplankton community composition from space. And I will um, finish this lecture by saying a few words about uh, future developments. Okay, so you probably have seen this kind of graph many, many times. So you probably all know very well that phytoplankton organisms are super important um, to the ecological functioning, to the biogeochemical functioning of the oceans. But what you may less have in mind is that phytoplankton organisms are not all the same at all. There, there's a huge, vari huge diversity in phytoplankton organisms. They're uh, variable in terms of size, pigmentation, shape, and all of these characteristics are, are extremely important to ecological. They have ecological implication, biogeochemical implication, optical implications, which we'll see are very useful for us. So I like that graph, that representation that try to give you an idea of the very broad range of size in phytoplankton cells. So it uh, helps you to visualize that through a comparison between the size range of phytoplankton and the size range of, we couldn't say regular object because we have like an orca. So, but you know, like microscopic object. So if, uh, does that work? Yeah, so if Procrococcus, which is like the, the tiniest organism, phytoplankton cell in the ocean, which is about one, less than one micron in size. So if this is the size of a fish, then Emilia oxlei, which is a coccolithophore, very well um, distributed ubiquitously, is about the size of an orca. And for example, this diatom or this dinoflagellate will be the size of the Eiffel Tower. Okay, so very broad, very broad distribution in size. 
phytoplankton diversity is critical to many processes in the ocean, in particular biogeochemical processes. So for example, we know that um, the phytoplankton community composition affects uh, not only the efficiency of carbon fixation through photosynthesis, it also influences the transfer of organic matter to hypertrophic uh, levels, and it also impacts on uh, the amount of carbon, of particularly carbon that is going to be exported to the ocean and then potentially sequestered. So it really impacts on the uh, capacity of the ocean to regulate the Earth's climate. Okay? So it's critical to account for that diversity. And um, in the context of uh, environmental and climate changes, we know that the environmental conditions in which phytoplankton organisms grow uh, will probably change, although we're not sure uh, how. For example, we have clues that uh, the stratification of the ocean is going to increase on a global scale, so that the subtropical oligotrophic gyres will expand and that the um, supply of, of nutrients uh, to the upper ocean will decrease. So we expect that this will have impact on phytoplankton community composition and through that impacts on biogeochemistry. So these are examples taken uh, from in-situ observations and results from a model that show interesting trends. Uh, so observe, uh, I think it's like a few, four, four year time period of observation in situ in the Arctic basin that show, um, so that's here, a decrease in the nitrate concentration of the upper ocean, which is uh, concomitant with uh, an increased contribution of small cells, to the uh, which is detrimental to, um, to larger cells, nanoplankton. And you may notice here that the chlorophyll concentration, which is an indicator of the biomass, is constant through time. So we have a shift in the community stru size structure, but not a shift in biomass, which is interesting. Okay, so here's very different, but um, uh, these are results from simulation uh, using a coupled ocean biogeochemical model. And this shows, the, the map shows the global distribution in, the, in changes in the relative contribution of diatoms to the total phytoplankton biomass. So they did try to, and this is done through a simulation over like 150 years, and they represent change in the climate by increasing the um, uh, PCO2. And then they'll see how the physics of the ocean change and how that affects phytoplankton and how that affects uh, biogeochemistry. And what they found is that um, significant decrease in the contribution of diatoms, which are m not al always, but mostly large cells. For example, especially here in the North Atlantic, which is known to be a major carbon sink, sink in the ocean. And this overall decrease in the contribution of diatoms uh, has impact in biogeochemistry through decrease in primary production and decrease in carbon export. So, phytoplankton diversity is extremely important and has to be taken into account, okay? To, I mean, to better characterize biogeochemistry of today's ocean and to also get some chance to predict uh, what will be the response of the ocean to future climate change. So in this context, Biogeochemical modelers have started to incorporate in the architecture of their model different groups of phytoplankton, different phytoplankton functional types. Okay, so this is um, this graph is a representation of the evolution of the architecture of biogeochemical models through time. Excuse me. Uh, so you can see that in the in the nineties. Maybe it's a bit small, I don't know. In the 90s, biogeochemical models were considered phytoplankton as a unique compartment. While in the years 2000s, they started having different phytoplankton functional types, okay? And here, we even have a new generation of model, uh, but Stephanie will tell you a bit more about that, where I think that the, uh, the number of phytoplankton groups is not predetermined, but it evolved through simulation depending on forcing factors. Am I correct? Um, okay, so knowing that, I mean, it's been recognized that developing capability to uh, discriminate different phytoplankton group um, and, in, and their space-time dynamics is critically important to, uh, from different perspective, 
and it has become a priority. So in parallel to the integration of these different groups of phytoplankton in biogeochemical models, then the ocean color community has also worked on developing approaches for um, extracting information on phytoplankton diversity from ocean color, uh, satellite ocean color observation. And as, I, and as David said, uh, it's been an area of very, very active research over more than a decade. Many papers published um, each and every year on the subject. And it's not so surprising if you consider um, the power, the uniqueness of satellite um, ocean color observations in terms of space-time coverage. If you think about it, ocean color gives you synoptic view of the upper, upper ocean uh, with a time resolution from a day to several years, uh, even for a decade, for example, for the sea wave sensor. So very interesting if you want to monitor the dynamics, space-time dynamics at uh, scales relevant to climate to, to, uh, and to environmental changes. Okay. Um, and if you're able to develop such a, a capability, then the application range is very, very broad. So these are just a few examples. But for example, you can gain insight into the biogeochemical cycling of the ocean, for example, through improved estimation of primary production and potentially even of carbon export. Uh, you, can you can produce output data for um, in initializing and validating biogeochemical models that, um, well, that stands for dynamic green ocean model, which, are the which is the generation of biogeochemical models that incorporate explicitly different groups of phytoplankton. So you have that, and you can also, for example, uh, develop application to um, detection of harmful algal blooms and application for water quality monitoring. So many potential applications. Okay, so about definition. Um, what is a phytoplankton functional type? Well, first, it's not a new concept, but it's been generalized to the community, and in particular to the ocean color community, when they started to be integrated in these biogeochemical models. So it really comes from there in our community. One of the definitions proposed in the literature was that a PFT would be an aggregation of organisms that sets a role or a function in the system, which means anything you want. I mean, it just means you have to come up with your own PFT classification depending on your scientific question. So this is what people do. OK, so for example, in the biogeochemical models, it makes sense. PFT classification is a, a PFT is a group of organisms that share common functional common function in the system. OK, so many uh, biogeochemical models have PFT classification such as this one, where you have silicifiers, calcifiers, nitrogen fixers, and picophyte plankton. Okay, so you can see that you come up with your definition depending on your needs because it's, I mean, it's a pretty heterogeneous classification. Here, guys interact, interacting with biogeochemical elements, and this one based on size. Okay, so the, I mean, uh, in summary, there's no clear definition of PFT. Another interesting um, PFT classification is based on size, which, have, which, which has many ecological, biogeochemical, and optical uh, implications. So you've probably seen in the literature you re you've reviewed that many algorithms produce uh, PFT products in terms of size. OK, so now that we've said this, how do we actually retrieve information on phytoplankton community composition using uh, information from satellites. There are, I would say, three major approaches to that. Either you use the reflectance signal or the radiance signal directly from what's given by the, the ocean color sensor, and you go to phytoplankton functional types. So that would be the reflectance or radiance based approach. Or you use the chlorophyll A concentration retrieved from ocean color observations, and you go to PFTs. Or third approach, you use the IOPs derived from uh, reflectance or radiance, and you go to PFT. And in the IOPs methods, uh, there's a split between method based on particle backscattering and methods based on phytoplankton absorption coefficient. OK, so that's uh, another view of these uh, methods. So before I forget to say it, I apologize. It's by far non-exhaustive, not exhaustive at all. There are plenty other methods published. 
uh, one of the criteria I used because I had to make a decision on the references I listed. So it's only multi PFTs. It's uh, dedicated to open ocean waters and it had to be uh, relevant for to global scale applications. But there are many others. For, um, for example, there are uh, methods dedicated to the retrieval of information for one given phytoplankton group. For example, you have algorithms to retrieve information on diatoms, on coccolithophores, on trichodesmium, probably others that I'm not aware of. Um, so as I was telling you, we have our chlorophyll-based approach, which is also referred to as abundance-based approach, uh, radiance, absorption backscattering, which from the IOP-based approach. Those three are considered spectral. They also refer to a spectral-based approach because they make use of changes in the spectral shape of those properties to infer information on phytoplankton diversity. And there's actually a fourth step, which I haven't mentioned in my previous slide, uh, that's uh, called the, the ecological-based approach. And actually, this one uses as input um, satellite-derived information on some sort of environmental factors, such as SST, irradiance, things like that. OK, but we're not going to talk about this one any, anymore in this lecture. No, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but the answer is no. I mean, through the, to the few numbers of validation and intercomparison exists has been done, there's, the, the answer to your question is none. Plus, there's not enough of this type of analysis to get a clear answer. OK. Um, so as you know, we will work on these three types of approach three, through three different papers. But before we do that, well, and before I forget to mention, I have selected those three papers not because I particularly like or dislike them, just because I think that they represent nicely the three different types of approach and they're relatively well used in the community, so it would be nice for you to, to have read them at least once. OK, so as I was telling you earlier, we're going to probably review some of the material you've seen with, during the other lectures, but through example from an ice cruise. Um, so I apologize in advance if you've, already see, if you've already seen these several, several times, but I think, I mean, I try to put that in the context, uh, in a context so that it really helps you to understand better the paper that we're going to discuss afterwards, OK? So the nice thing about the, the Biosop cruise, which was held uh, in 2005 in the subtropical, su su south subtropical Pacific Ocean. Um, so beside the fact that it's nice to travel a little through data, it's interesting because the, during that cruise, the, the vessel travels across very different trophic regimes, bioptical conditions, biochemical conditions so that the result we're going to, to see, we're going to examine, I mean, I cannot say that they're representative of what you would see if you look at the global ocean, but at least we'll be able to get some trend that are somewhat relevant to larger scales, okay? And another important aspect is that we're in open ocean condition with mixed phytoplankton assemblages. So what does that mean? That means that we are in relatively low chlorophyll concentration regimes, and we have um, phytoplankton population made of different groups which is very typical of open ocean conditions and it, which is very challenging for PFT discrimination. But this is what we have to deal with every day. Um, okay, so first I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about phytoplankton pigments and how um, they can be used to infer information on phytoplankton community composition and size structure. Uh, so I'm not sure what you already know about pigments, probably a little. Um, you probably all know that all phytoplankton organisms have chlorophyll A as their main photosynthetic pigments. Uh, what you may not have in mind, though, is that they, al I mean, they also all have 
accessory pigments, but those accessory pigments vary from phytoplankton taxa to from phytoplankton taxon to another. So that some accessory pigment can be used as specific biomarkers of some phytoplankton groups. So this is what I've um, put here in this table, where, for example, I mean these are not th the list of pigment that you could use as biomarker is bigger than that, but these are very commonly used biomarker pigments. For example, zeaxanthin is known to be the main, the main pigment, uh, extra pigments found in cyanobacteria. You have a uh, 19 prime exanoloxy fucoxanthin, which is very typical of primnesophytes, for example. You have fucoxanthin, which is not only, but mostly found in diatoms. Okay? So, uh, sorry, and what is the function of these pigments? Why Pitoplankton has these pigments? They have this pigment to help them to capture light at wavelengths that are not reached by chlorophyll. Okay, but they to cover a broader spectrum. They are also for photosynthesis? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So now we can even push a little further the interpretation of diagnostic pigment in terms of size classes. So the idea here is that you have one diagnostic pigment which is more or less specific to one phytoplankton taxon and then the taxon is assigned to a size class depending on the typical size of the organisms. So this classification is not perfect, but it's useful, especially for large scale applications. Okay, so for example, cyanobacteria, we know that they're small cells, prenasophyll would be in the medium sized range and diatoms are typically large cells. Um, Maybe I'll tell you the limitation right now, really, so I don't have to go back to that. So for example, as I told you, um, so fucoxanthin is the main carotenoid found in diatoms, but it's also found in some primnasophytes. Uh, same for this one, which is the main carotenoids of primnasophytes, but it's also found in some bacteria. So it's clearly not perfect. Same as to size classification. Uh, diatoms are typically large cells, but they're also sometimes found in this size range. Okay, so as you can see, phytoplankton pigments are not perfect proxies of um, phytoplankton community composition, but they're very useful. And you can go quantitative, which is also nice. So for example, if you want to estimate the contribution of those three size classes to the total chlorophyll biomass, you just have to sum the contribution of the corresponding diagnostic pigments and divide that by the sum of all the diagnostic pigments you selected. And as you can see, you, uh, each diagnostic pigment is weighed by a coefficient that represents the ratio between the diagnostic pigment to the total chlorophyll concentration, okay? And of course, if you want to obtain chlorophyll concentration associated with each size class, you just have to multiply the person contribution by the total chlorophyll concentration. That's, just, that's, that's one method, but that's not the only one. So HPLC pigments, represent one method, but not the only one for retrieving information on PFTs, community structure, whatever you call it. There's, for example, microscopy, plus cytometry, genetics, other methods. And among the methods for interpreting pigments in terms of PFTs, this is, is not just one method. There are other, for example, there's uh, the Chemtex met method, which is uh, widely used to, um, that I would say push the interpretation of pigments in terms of taxonomy groups, uh, groups a little further. And uh, those two are actually represent modification to these ratio size classes, etc. Okay, so now we're going to look at some data. So these are vertical profiles of diagnostic pigments. So I've selected the three main pigments uh, at selected station across the, the biosorption sex. So for example, here we're in the Marquesas Island, mesotrophic regime. Here we're in, at the gyre station, so we're here in ultra oligotrophic waters. Here, e.g., that's the eastern border of the gyre, and here we're in the upwelling of jail. Okay, so what do, we, what do we have here in the water? So we have in Marquesas Island, you can see that we have a lot of uh, exanoiloxifico exantin, so we, kind of, we have probably a population dominated by prenasophytes, typical of, of mesotrophic conditions, so middle range of chlorophyll concentration. Here we're on the gyre, we have a lot of the exantin, 
which suggests the presence, important concentration of cyanobacteria. Very typical too of oligotrophic conditions, as we know that cyanobacteria, small cell, they like to, they're prefer preferentially found in oligotrophic stratified environments. Uh, here, hmm, we have two pigments at important concentration. Uh, so probably cyanobacteria and primnesiophytes, which is more typical of a transition regime. And here we have a lot of hugoxanthin, which has to be uh, an indication of a dominance by diatoms because we're in an upwelling system and we know that diatoms um, are favored in like very di dynamic environment with lots of nutrients, typical of, of, of a pulling system. Okay, so now what happens if we look at, um, so it's, it's still the bios of data set, but we're looking at how the, we'll say the pigment-based size structure of the communities varies as a function of chlorophyll concentration. It's one way of showing it. So you have all the stations, and these are only surface concentration. Surface chlorophyll concentration here. Do we see any pattern? Sort of, it's pretty nice. We have, as I was telling you, uh, here we have station with very low chlorophyll concentration dominated more by the pico size fractions. Intermediate level of chlorophyll around here, more dominated by nano size fractions. Here at the upwelling station, we have a dominance of the micro size, size fraction. Okay, so there's a pretty, oops, pretty nice trend um, in terms of evolution of PFTs with respect to chlorophyll concentration. But as you can see, there's also interesting deviations to this trend. So clearly it's not perfect, okay? For example, we have here station dominated with both micro and pico plankton, which is very, very unusual. We also have here relatively high concentration of chlorophyll at station dominated by pico plankton. Quite unusual too, but that's how it is in the ocean, okay? So a pretty nice trend, but deviations clearly. Okay, so now, we're going to we are going to review stuff that you've probably seen quite a lot. So we you, we will see how good you are interpreting the spectra. So we have so these are phytoplankton absorption spectra, not normalized, measured in situ in surface water at the gyre and at the upwelling station. So what do you think? What do they look like that? why this one is so flat and why this one is high. Yes, Vicky. Any ID? They are not normalized. Because of the, it's because of the biomass. <laughs> you need to have some biomass to absorb light. Here we have very low chlorophyll concentration. It's like 0.02 milligram per cubic meter in surface. So not much absorption. Here we have a lot of biomass, so stronger absorption signal. Okay, now what happens if we normalize those spectra by the chlorophyll concentration? You see a reverse pattern. So now you tell me why you see this pattern. You've seen this with Darius, with, in Darius lecture, I was here. <laughs> Yes, packaging effect caused by? Caused by? <laughs> so it's, it's caused by, um, it's, so the, here you have a relatively flat spectra, while this one has a nice peak in the blue compared to this one, and it's caused mostly by the size of the, the dominant, um, the, the, the size of the, of the population, the average size of the population. So we have more, small cells at the gyro station, and we have more large cells at the, at, at the, the upwelling station, so that's why we have such a shift, okay? So now, what happens if we look at um, a larger data sets? So I've cheated a little here. We are not only looking at the bios of data, we also have data from a cruise in the Atlantic Ocean from south to north, so entire south and north basin. Um, and so we are still looking at normalized phytoplankton absorption spectra and the color code is similar to what I've shown you on the, on the first graph. Um, the color code indicates dominance, the, 
indicate the pigment-based size class that dominates the phytoplankton population. So we we'll still have this pretty nice trend. We we'll still have a pretty nice uh, relationship, at least visually, between PFT composition and the shape of the phytoplankton absorption spectra. So you have relatively flatter spectra at stations dominated by large phytoplankton. We have you have more uh, peaked um, absorption spectra at population dominated by small cell, by picophytoplankton, and those dominated by the nanophytoplankton, they're in between. So it works pretty nicely. Is it perfect, this uh, classification? Maybe not. Um, so if you remember from a previous lecture, you've probably seen that the shape of the phytoplankton absorption spectra depends on pigment composition. These are the absorbers, so they have to impact the shape of this. Um, it depends on the size, which induce packaging effect. But does packaging effect, is, in, is package effect induced only by the size? No, it's also induced by change in environmental condition through increase to changes in, in the intracellular concentrations. For example, if you're uh, in an environment with less light, with a reduced light intensity, the cells will tend to produce more pigment, so they will increase their intracellular pigment concentration, which will also result in the flattening of the phytoplankton absorption spectra. Okay, so this correlation, if I may say, between PFT composition and spectral shape of absorption is pretty good, but it's not perfect. Okay, it's also influenced by environmental factors. All right, so the pretty nice thing about that, about this approach, is that usually, I mean, most of the time, all the drivers of the spectral shape of absorption by phytoplankton co-vary. So, for example, um, Payment composition, size, and uh, environmental condition induced packaging tend to co-vary, which facilitate the interpretation. For example, you have cyanobacteria, which are relatively which are small cells, so reduce packaging. They have a lot of zeaxanthin, which increase absorption in the blue. So you go, you know, uh, so you tend to even have a, a, a phytoplankton, phytoplankton absorption, absorption spectra that is more peaked in the blue. And they live, typic they're typically found in oligotrophic stratified environment with lots of light, so even less reason for being packaged, okay? Um, okay, so now we're looking at reflectance spectra. And after that, we are done with this part, okay? <laughs> so what do we see here? We are back to our two, constructed, two contrasted stations, gyre and upwelling. Gyre upwelling, blue light emanating of the ocean, more green light caused by chlorophyll concentrations and covariant constituents. So I took a few pictures so that you can visualize color of the ocean in relationship to chlorophyll. So that's this picture has actually been taken here at the gyre station. So you see that you have like almost purple waters. Um, which is related to very low chlorophyll concentration. This picture is very nice. I'm surprised no one else showed it to usually Hervé put it in all his presentation. Um, here, summer oligotrophic condition at the, Mussol, at the Boussole mooring, uh, blue water. And here you have spring conditions, which means bloom, bloom conditions, where you have green water in correlation with the chlorophyll concentration. Okay. So now we repeat our exercise uh, with these, the shape of the reflectance spectrum. We have our Biosol plus Atlantic data set. And still our color code indicating for each spectra the dominance, how, how was the, the um, pigment based as class dominance for each station. So do we see any good correlation between those two, between PFT composition and the shape of reflectance? Sort of, if we are very <laughs> motivated, I'm kidding. I mean, we see some correlation. We see some correlation. For example, we have this nice spectra with green light associated with microfat plankton. We have those nice spectra uh, associated with a dominance of picophyte plankton. So 
and, and the nanophytoplankton dominated station are more or less in between. It's not perfect, clearly, but there's some trend. So my interpretation of that is that if you're trying to discriminate PFTs from the spectral shape of reflectance directly, when I mean directly, I mean without any step to, for example, phytoplankton absorption, then you will at some point have to rely on co-variation between PFT composition and bioptical status, which determines the shape of the, of the reflectance spectra. <laughs> um, okay, unless, unless you're in very specific condition with super high concentrations uh, of like one given type that would really impose an optical signature but it is not very typical of open ocean conditions. Or uh, we, if you're trying to discriminate the signature of one phytoplankton type that have very, very specific um, optical signature, for example, this one, Cochlethophores, which has a, ve which have, um, a very strong particulate backscattering signal, so they can be discriminating among other phytoplankton groups. But it's a sort of specific case. Okay. I don't know what time it is. Uh, so now we're going to move on to our small group discussion. So uh, have you all been able to read the paper, one of the three papers, everyone? Yes? Um, so what we will do, I don't know if you want to take a break now or maybe after that. Well, I'll tell you what we do and then we decide, yeah, okay? How much time you want to this, you know? I'd like them to split in three groups and discuss about this. So these are the key points, key questions I'd like you to identify for each of the three papers, one per group, of course. And so I don't know, maybe 30 minutes, less if you need less, you know. And I'd like that for each group, one of you come and present these key points so we can review that together. Um, what I would like to do, if possible, what I would like you to do, if possible, is that you try to take a step back so that you don't go into the details of the papers, but more about the general philosophy, especially for the principal strengths and weaknesses. If possible, I'd like you to be able to uh, identify uh, points that would be relevant to other papers using the same approach. Okay? Like, I don't, we don't really care if. This approach provides a root mean square error of 36% of stuff like that, or if it used 41 uh, data points instead of 42, you know? So try to, I'm, I, know it, I know it's not easy because it's the first time probably that you were working on such papers, but just try to do so, okay? Okay, guys, are you ready? Yep. I, I need someone beside me from the chlorophyll based group. Their main plan here was to uh, develop a relationship between normalized water leaving radiance and uh, several different pigments other than chlorophyll A um, and to see if that can be used to distinguish PFTs. So to do that they had actually a pretty good data set um, and just nine cruises. Um, I think it was, uh, they were 40 day cruises and they took five samples a day. So they ended up with a really robust data set of um, pigment um, groups, I guess is what you could call it, but out of that, in terms of matching it up with satellite reflectance data, they only got 41 matchups in terms of looking at quality and things like that, so shows you a bit of a problem um, trying to do that sort of thing. Um, what they did, they normalized uh, the normalized water leaving radiance to chlorophyll A, so to kind of remove the effect of the chlorophyll A that's with all the different um, phytoplankton groups, and so you're looking at it's actually normalized to uh, to a water living to, to a normalized water living radiance spectrum for average for a certain chlorophyll concentration. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Normalized right. to chlorophyll. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So anyway, we, they end up with this kind of lookup table idea um, <laughs> with this and relating that, and so they uh, uh, came up with this relationship and. Uh, they were able to use this in a global monthly mean um, sort of approach where they were able to just use CWIFs uh, water leaving radiance to produce PFT maps. And um, what they were able to get was essentially a, a distinction in dominance, I believe, between 
uh, just really four phytoplankton functional types. And diet, I forget the exact ones, but diatoms and so forth. Um, the good is it's simple, uh, good rough estimation, um, good spatial resolution, and they built it around a, a really robust in situ data set. Um, the bad we said was there's only four groups uh, that could be distinguished. Um, they, they make a statement that there are many um, groups that are not encapsulated in their data set, so they're missing uh, a lot of potential uh, compositions, um, especially in the high latitudes. Um, Case one waters only, they, they filtered it. Uh, I think the minimum was 0.04 to 3 milligrams per cubic meter, so anything outside of that range was not um, considered. Um, anything else, group? Anything else? Awesome. That was pretty good. Summer? Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, I mean, many points are quite similar to what you guys found, which is pretty good. Um, mm -hmm doesn't mean that there's any perfect answer to these key points. I mean, anyone c comes with, its, uh, with ease or her own interpretation, of course. So um, as you said, principle is to empirically associate changes in dominant PFT with uh, changing the spectral shape of normalized, of normalized, normalized <laughs> um, water living radiant spectra. Uh, development da data set, as you said, was a relatively large data set, but due to the constraint, I mean, they, it, it's good that they did that. I mean, they put a lot of um, constraints on the quality of the data they wanted to use as a matchup between, between radiant uh, spectra and, dom and dominance in terms of PFT. But the problem is that then they came up with a very small uh, matchup data set, which is somewhat limiting to develop a global scale algorithm, but you know, you have to do with what we have at some point. Um, blah, 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 input data, you're right. So they use their, uh, their water living radiance uh, used in combination with the lookup table, output product, P dominant PFTs among four. And so uh, to me, the, the strength of the method is really that it directly used uh, the satellite product which is good. I mean, if you remove a step in the processing, you have more chances to remove um, extra uncertainties. Um, the weaknesses to me is really that there's it's empirical associate, association between dominant PFT and the spectral shape of these, uh, re, of these uh, normalized, normalized which are living really in spectra. So that if um, you're in a situation where you go out of this trend that they set up, then the algorithm will fail. And um, in a future ocean, we may expect that this, associate, that this association will fail to, I mean, will, won't hold anymore because, I don't know, we may have, for example, for some reason, more sedum or more whatever that backscatters so that the spectral shape um, of the water living radiant spectra may change, but the, you won't have any change in the community composition. Okay. Any questions? Do you want to comment, Colin? Well, I'm curious because I, I don't remember, but is there a relationship between the concentration of phytoplankton and the particular groups that they identified? And that's something that Julia talked about earlier that you have very low biomass um, in waters where you tend to find cyanobacteria. So is the shape of the spectrum that they called cyanobacteria really due to cyanobacteria or due to the fact that it's low biomass? No, they, 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 they have an histogram showing, trying to show these, and, and the conclusion is the same as Julia, that, it's not, that there's no direct relationship. They only found diatoms where there's very high chlorophyll, but for the rest is like, the distribution is the same. Yeah, so this association more reflects uh, the coverability, just let me finish, coverability between PFTs and bioptical status. That's a largely indirect impact of what's in the water, which is probably dominated by something and leading to this anomaly in the water being reflected. So that's usually a, a largely indirect in detection. But I think, you know, if this one got some success when it uh, appeared so more than 10 years ago, it was because this simple idea to normalize, 
So to remove the first order effect of the process. But we didn't think of this before, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's kind of simple, but that was the first time that they used it in this, uh, in this uh, yes. approach. So that was quite successful. There's a, a very good paper by uh, Brown et al. 2008 that used that same idea of normalizing and removing the effect of biomass from the water living radiant spectra and to, an so to analyze that second order variability uh, with respect to sedum concentration, backscattering uh, signal and things like that. Um, okay. That's a very good question. It all depends on the on the paper, basically. So in this case, uh, I think that they considered dominance based on the ratio between uh, biomarker pigments to total chlorophyll A, and they did some literature review for their regions, and they came up with their own criterion for dominance. That's one of the limits of the pigment-based approach. <laughs> Just to last comment on that, I, I think the, if they started at that time to look in this direction, you know, to normalize and look at these things, is, I, I think I remember at that time, the, most people were thinking that anyway we would not be able to detect anything directly, you know, by absorption feature or whatever, that that would be completely lost in the signal for that an indirect way of uh, determining PFTs would be needed. So I think that was critical logic at that time. Now we come back a bit on this, and we start to think that, OK, with hyperspectral things, maybe. the hyperspectral. Yeah. They, they yeah. had a few wavelengths, yeah, so. and the thought was you could not get no. any of those features with just a couple of wavelengths. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, so. We were reviewing the paper on uh, the chlorophyll approach, and uh, so basically it's based on so on the chlorophyll from like potentially reflectance of the interval, and uh, based on the fact that different size groups have different chlorophyll levels, and that uh, both chlorophyll and size groups uh, respond to environments uh, in this in similar ways, and so that uh, taxonomic specific pigments. Uh, can be used to differentiate different uh, size groups and different trophic status. And so um, this is important because, as Julia said, that uh, we need uh, estimation of the uh, different phytoplankton uh, sizes for the carbon export. And so the data sets on this work were uh, uh, basically <coughs> in situ data sets. And also um, uh, sea whiffs, so from like uh, satellite, so and mostly average. And uh, the, it's uh, an advantage uh, actually because they use very different data sets to validate uh, and to make it comprehensive. So it's it's a good point. And uh, it was in the important uh, data set, so we emphasized this last last week also. Um, uh, to run the algorithm, they use so the reflectance or the chlorophyll, and this is also a good point because uh, we can use chlorophyll from other type of uh, uh, like gliders or bioagroflutes, for example, where we don't have reflectance, we have the chlorophyll. And um, another good point is that of the method is that it, it, it used a continuum of chlorophyll, whereas Julia would say. I call mo the, the, the model were based on benches of uh, chlorophyll. So here it's a continuum. And um, uh, it allows us to retrieve the relative size structure of the community in general. Um, the main advantages so are, are the fact that, like, so it's a, a chlorophyll based approach. So, like, difference from spectral approach is that spectral approach is like it's difficult to manage to find the differences here so it's based on the, on the chlorophyll uh, no bad and in situ data are like quality control and assured database so it's it's a good point uh, so it can be applied to float or gliders um, and in this paper particularly they have 
uh, increase the discrimination for uh, picophytoplankton because one of the di diagnostic pigments, which is the 19HF, uh, is normally considered as nanophytoplankton, but here they like find another solution to put it more in, in pico, pico, pico phytoplankton because it can be sometimes uh, overestimated with the model of Julia. Um, and uh, there is also potential uh, for depth-derived uh, profiles. And the bad points, of course, weaknesses, uh, which we uh, talk a little bit of it. Uh, it's like the pigments are not taxa-specific, so sometimes there is a pigment that can be also in another taxa, for example, fucoxanthin. Uh, and uh, the, the microphytoplankton and the different size classes are not like uh, uh, only based on the size, can be based on the, the, the pigments. And uh, it doesn't capture the case two waters, so it's only for case one water, again, this model. Um, there can be um, different response in like for light and nutrients uh, implications. So photoacclimation, for example, response that can change the, 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 the amount of chlorophyll, which is like important, which is based on for this. Uh, it also badly responds for like for example cyanobacteria, big blooms, like it's tiny cells, but that there is a lot of chlorophyll, so and it's little cells. So like this is not very useful. And um, so in our group actually we ju just me and Charlotte know about the PFT. It's easy for me, as I have <laughs> Julia Witz as a sp supervisor, mm -hmm. and not the, uh, the others. Um, and just we had like comments and questions, like because we are speaking about those different models, we are wondering if it's possible like to merge all the models. Like there is possibility to I don't know, like when the three models find uh, the same uh, phytoplankton community, maybe it's some more checked. Um, phytoplankton group or like something like this. That's all. Okay. Yes, we, we will we will work on combined approach with Colleen. That's one of our objectives <laughs> in the future. So you see, it's that I mean, you did a really good job. But it's not necessarily very easy uh, to um, get a, to, to get critical when you read the paper because, for example, for y for your paper, I've noticed that one of the strengths like weaknesses were taken from the paper itself. So, so, by the, so these are pros and cons acknowledged by the authors themselves, but sometimes they don't. So you have to do this work yourself, okay? Um, okay, so, so that was this one. Yes. Uh, so as you've uh, notice the principle is very simple is the relation global relationships between trophic status as indexed on surface chlorophyll concentration as can be derived from space um, we change in the community composition we've seen with those bias of data very low chlorophyll concentration lots of picophyte plankton cyanobacteria uh, when you move to more uh, to higher chlorophyll concentration you get a lot of big cells okay so it's really based on this shift uh, in size structure with trophic regime. Uh, development data set, you, did all, uh, you said a lot about that. Actually, the development data set is really based on AMT, Atlantic Cruise data. But then they did a really good job in validating, checking other assumptions using plenty other data set, AMT, independent AMT data set, nomad data set, uh, maybe some other things that I missed. So really good job on that side. Uh, input data, simply surface chlorophyll derived from satellite, but as you mentioned, it could be any type of chlorophyll concentrations, which is really good. Output product, person contribution of three pigment based classes with all the limitations that this, this approach has, as we've talked about already. Um, the strength is really easy, just need the chlorophyll concentration, it, it pops up, it pop up with the person contribution of different groups of phytoplankton. Another thing is that it relies on something that's that usually observe. I mean, it's, it's a real ecological trend, although it has deviations. Okay, so that's a pretty good thing. 
I think, for this approach. And on the weaknesses side, I think that you've said a mole. I mean, yeah, definitely it cannot predict atypical conditions, like atypical association between chlorophyll concentration and PFTs. Um, you cited the example of a cyanobacteria bloom. Yeah, high biomass with cyanobacteria, this cannot predict. And another problem might be that as the ocean will change with environmental change, with changes in environmental condition and climate change, we will have to recalibrate. I mean, there's no reason why this uh, relationship will, ho will hold in a future ocean. If you remember, um, in my introduction, I show you this example where we have a shift uh, towards smaller, smaller size of phytoplankton organism with constant chlorophyll A concentration. Okay, do you have questions about that? Uh, well, one thing to add a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's on the chlorophyll concentration of picoplankton. When usually when you do size fractionation, if you're in a very like oligotrophic region with a lot of light, usually the cyanobacteria tend to be more bleached than eukaryotes, for instance, in this fraction. So like chlorophyll A can maybe not be the ideal proxy for biomass. Absolutely. What do you, what do you mean by bleach? Uh, they have less pigment per cell. Okay, yeah, which is linked to acclimation. Yes, we know that chlorophyll A is the most wi widely used proxy for phytoplankton biomass. It doesn't mean that it's the best proxy. We're trying to develop an approach that will use uh, carbon specific to phytoplankton, but it's just extremely difficult to measure. Otherwise, we would definitely be all working on phytoplankton specific carbon concentration. That's one of the goals for the future. Okay, can I have someone for the, for the third one? I know, guys, it, it was, it's a difficult paper. So I get the answers right away? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you have to work. <laughs> Come on, away. Okay, so we had the Anikendrico 2006 paper, uh, which is uh, absorption-based. So it uses the fact that um, uh, it basically applies uh, the uh, packaging effect that large phytoplankton have a higher absorption in the green and small phytoplankton have a higher absorption in the um, blue. And it derives a single size uh, parameter by defining like a pico phytoplankton absorption which is peaked in the blue and the macro no micro uh, phytoplankton absorption which peaks in the red and that size parameter varies between them, which doesn't mean it's a mixture between only pico and microphytoplankton, but it's like if it's 0.5, that, that uh, size parameter is like probably something resembling to, to nanophytoplankton. Um, the phytoplankton absorption is decomposed from the total absorption, uh, which is in turn derived from the remote sensing reflectance. So that merged to the principle um, the data set or the, the approach was developed uh, from in situ data from three cruises where they measured um, absorption of sedum, absorption of uh, non algal particles, absorption of phytoplankton particles, as well as chlorophyll with the fluorometer. And um, these absorption spectra were degraded to the uh, CWIFS uh, resolution between 412 and 555 uh, nanometers, so 55 five, um, wavelengths. And um, what so the they also validated that with Steve's matchups for these cruises. So that's basically the development data set as input data. Um, they use total absorption um, at these five wavelengths, which in turn is derived by a uh, by method from remote sensing reflectance. But that's a step before the actual um, Thierry and Rico paper. The output product, as mentioned earlier, is that one size um, parameter, giving a range between for yeah decomposing like pico or a mixture of whatever in between pico microplankton or so nanoplankton and microplankton, and the strength is that it um, is based on kind of an uh, actual mechanistic um, idea because that packaging effect is not empirical, but actually observed also in the lab, and you have kind of an idea. Um, it wasn't tuned to a specific region, so uh, in principle it's globally, uh, globally uh, applicable, uh, and it was these, these 
spectral fate variations are also observed globally and they used a um, rather extensive data set to, to derive these shapes. Um, for the weakness, it's not only size that influences um, the shape, but it's also uh, like light accumulation. If you have a small picoplankton uh, pico that is in high latitudes where it appears low light levels that on average, that one expresses more pigments than the same picoplankton in the region where it has higher light levels. So size isn't the only thing that affects that um, difference between blue and green um, absorption. And um, yes, I think that's all of that. So an additional thing is um, for some of the parameterizations, it also uses chlorophyll. So um, you have remote sensing reflectance that you use to derive the phytoplankton absorption uh, spectra, but also the same reflectance that derive chlorophyll at some point, and they both in the mathematics and the equations then lead together to that size parameter. So it's not completely independent of chlorophyll as well. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. So you got, I mean, you were, you were very worried, but you got them all. So no problem with this approach, right? No, I mean, this paper was a little bit tricky but he, because, I mean, I asked them to focus on the retrieval of that, of that size parameter, but it's really mixed with many other stuff. Lots of ocean color inversion, decomposition. So essentially, um, the CODM Rico approach uses remote sensing reflectance. Apply, I think, the Loisel and Stramsky model to retrieve total absorption. And then they use, they propose different approaches to retrieve that size, paramet that size parameter. Um, either by splitting a total into, as you've seen several times during your lectures, a uh, by, by phytoplankton, a by dissolved um, material, a by non algal particles, or by uh, using um, uh, it's ocean core inversion where you basically minimize what, what you observed, what the satellite has measured with what you can reconstruct using different IOPs. I don't find the term I'm looking for anyway. So it's difficult. I mean, that was, I, I recognize that was difficult to read, but really um, I asked you to focus on that size parameter. So in terms of principle, yes, it's really like uh, a change in size that um, induces a change in the spectral shape of phi spectral absorption. Um, you say all that. I mean, there are yeah, several empirical parameterizations so that it's not totally mechanistic. There's some empirical parameterization in the approach. Tested on the regional data set from Brazil. Um, input, input, input. So you're using reflectance, but what, re what you're really after is phytoplankton absorption spectra to retrieve the size parameter. Um, the, your output product is that size index. Uh, when it's zero, it means you have 100% of microphytoplankton, 100% of pico, 0% uh, of pico. And when it's one, it means you have 100% pico. The strength really is that it's, uh, it relies on the mechanistic principle. I mean, the size of phytoplankton organisms really have a spectral impact on phytoplankton absorption. So that's really what makes the strength of this approach. Weaknesses, as you said, problem like environmental condition may induce changes in intracellular pigment concentration that may result in similar changes as size on the shape of absorption by phytoplankton. Are you okay? Still awake? <laughs> Do you have questions? question? suggested any way to I don't know, account for the average light to correct for that possible well, in theory, when you're dealing with uh, only surface data, you're kind of removing a lot of the photoacclimation effect that you will definitely encounter very strongly when you're dealing with vertical profile. So that's when, you, when you're dealing with ocean core observation, in theory, you're more or less safe on that side, but not totally safe, of course. So you're just dealing with the fact that the bigger cells just naturally have more packaging even when they have low internal concentrations of pigment they're still bigger and have a longer pack length in the cell so they are just naturally more packaged even in highlight than small cells are 
Thank you. So, and, and the fact that they have pigments that tend to make them a little bit more green than the picoplankton. So that those two factors lead to the differences between their two eigenvectors. So, and if you, I can't remember if I mentioned, but you can use this Chiodi method with those two eigenvectors if you use the GIOP inversion model. And so you have the capability of testing actually on the reflected data that you've been provided, you can actually run all three of these models that Julia's presented to you and see where the, the confluence comes together or where they're different. Thank you, Colin. Um, I just wanted to show you an example of application because I know that they, in this COD and Brico paper they don't have any application so it's a bit sad not to see any global map of, of PFTs. Um, so these are the, the results from, uh, from the chlorophyll based approach, the um, radiance based approach and the size factor from the, from the spectra absorption based approach. So that's interesting because, I mean, at least qualitatively, overall, the distribute. I mean, they provide very similar response, although they're based on a very different principle. Input data, even output, are all totally different um, strengths and weaknesses. So, for example, here you have a global distribution for the months of May of the, your three uh, size fraction based on pigments. Um, I mean, retrieved from ocean core observation, but based on the pigment-based approach um, as person contribution. So you will see, for example, lots of microphyte plankton here in uh, that coincide with the spring bloom, which you will also see here. You have quite a dominance of diatoms for some pixel here in the North Atlantic. Here you will see a relatively low value of the size index, which is associated, which indicates um, relatively large cells. In contrast, lots of pico side cell here, about like yeah, almost 70% contribution to the total algal biomass in subtropical oligotrophic gyres. Here, quite a lot of uh, a mixture of Cynecococcus and Procolococcus from the avant uh, model. And here you have very strong values of the size index, even stronger than they should be if you look at that. So is, I mean, I have actually a question for Colin. I mean, you see that this is superior, it's greater than one, which shouldn't be. In, in theory, the size index can go from zero to one. So my question is, does it, <laughs> um, is it caused by uh, the retrieval of total absorption that's very, from reflectant that's difficult in these waters? Yes? That's probably it. If you just have such a small uncertainty in retrieving absorption, it could be negative, which would lead you to okay. a, a greater than one value. Um, the other thing I think is really interesting, we didn't talk about it much, but there's an inversion um, for size parameter based upon the slope of backscattering that you could retrieve from inversion um, by uh, Tico Kostanadov. And if you look at his retrieval of the slope of backscattering, you get almost exactly the same results as all of these. And those are based on size spectra, or, or uh, spectra of backscattering compared to being based upon absorption far away. or on the large And so I think what those all say is that we have these very broad regions of the oceans which have vastly different reflectance spectra. And you can interpret the absorption aspects of it, the chlorophyll aspects of it, or the size of backscattering of them. And they all give you these dominant regions of the ocean, which we know are sort of fundamentally different ecologically on those types of scales. OK, so now I'd like to say a quick word about um, how the international com PFT community has structured around different projects. So I've told you that this uh, field of research, like developing PFT algorithm for application to ocean core, is extremely active. Many people working on that subject at the moment. But the nice thing about that is that there has really been, um, I mean, the, 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 inter the international ocean core PFT community has really well structured around common project related to that subject. So that's that's a pretty good thing. Uh, one of the common project was to try to 
uh, develop intercomparison exercises among those uh, PFT approaches. So um, that was the first exercise was carried out by uh, Bob Brin during his PhD thesis, where he tried to evaluate, compare um, with respect to in situ data about five, PFT, five different PFT algorithms. And the outcomes of the study were interesting. I mean, you asked about that um, a little bit earlier. None algorithm would stand out compared to others. None perform any better there. They have different responses in different conditions, but overall performance are, uh, are equivalent, uh, despite the fact that they all rely on very different principles. Uh, another interesting, and maybe more interesting outcome of that study is, is that it was super difficult to actually strictly compare all those approach because they all require different input data because, and because they all produce different outputs. So how do you compare rigorously person, pico, micro, nano, SF, and diatom, dominance of diatom prochlorophyte? I mean, some of them are qualitative, some of them are quantitative. Uh, among quantitative uh, outputs, you have person contribution, you have absolute uh, chlorophyll biomass, even carbon biomass from the last, last um, paper by Tiho, I think. So that's definitely an issue. So more work needed than that. Um, so yeah, so a second, it's not really, it's not an evaluation because there's no in-situ data to which uh, the, res the output are compared. But here, Tiho compare outputs from PFT, ocean color-based PFT approaches and biogeochemical model in uh, predicting some phenological parameters. For so he focused on criteria of, of diatom bloom, actually, or micro phytoplankton bloom. So he determined um, different characteristics such as in this time of initiation of the bloom, duration of the bloom, amplitude of, of the bloom, things like that. So that's a paper in revision. Uh, another thing, another, another project around which the committee has been pretty active is, uh, was um, the writing of reports dedicated to identifying the different approaches, um, identifying their pros and cons, and making a recommendation for the future. So there is a pretty nice uh, report by the IOCCG working group on phytoplankton functional types from, from space. I put this one in your Dropbox folder. I think it's pretty, it's pretty nice. It's a good overview of the, of the subject. Uh, there's another report uh, that was issued after a meeting at the Ocean Optics Conference in Portland that's more dedicated to how are we going to validate our product well, we don't know yet, but we're working on it, basically. Um, and there's also a user guide that's just been submitted. That should be interesting for the community. OK, so as to evaluation, comparison of, of um, PFT output products, um, I'd like you to be aware that we are definitely facing important issues. They are not all here, uh, but they're important. So for example, if you really want to evaluate, to validate a model in principle, ideally, you should be able to validate each and every step uh, the model go through. So for example, if you use the, say, the Ciotti Brico model, you need to validate the reflectance data against in situ measurements. You need to validate all the IOPs, meaning total absorption, fight victim absorption, seed arm absorption, you name it, and then you need to, um, to validate your final product. Most of the time, what we do, I've done it myself, you just evaluate that stuff. Um, as I was telling you, very difficult to compare, to really compare uh, strictly output products when they're different. It's really like comparing apples and oranges, difficult. Uh, so a new strategy needs to be identified, and honestly, the community is working on that, but there's no clear answer to that yet. Okay, another very important <laughs> issue is that, so you see here, um, um, in situ PFTs, critical for validation and also for developing algorithms. The problem is that we are not good at measuring PFTs in situ. Yeah, I know it's, it's, it's bad, but so there's no idling for measuring, determining PFTs in situ. There's different ways, but none of them is really ideal. 
Um, microscopy, for example, will target a specific size range. So most of the time you miss a large size fraction. Plus, it's very, very, very time consuming. So you, won't, you will never get super large data sets for, of microscopic counts. Um, standard flow cytometry will focus on the small organisms, pico and nano at the most. Um, image in flow cytometry would be ideal, but it's extremely it's expensive. Can you remind us the quotation we got? <laughs> $150, something like that? Okay, so it's expensive, so it's maybe one day, but it's not tomorrow that we are going to have uh, imaging flow cytometers all over the world. So, and, so we, and we have pigments. We, so we've already mentioned several limitations um, related to pigment-based approach, limitation as to the ambiguity of some biomarker pigments, limitation if you push the interpretation to size classes because some taxon spread over larger size range, then you would assume using, this, using the pigment-based method to size classes. Um, the good thing about HPLC determined pigments is that uh, they cover the full, the entire algal biomass, which is really good. You go quantitative, also very good. And it's relatively, it's not, it's not very cheap, but it's relatively inexpensive, at least compared to other methods, so that you can definitely get pretty large uh, data sets. And it's, so far, it's really been the most commonly used method in the field of PFT algorithm development and validation. And yeah, slowly we're trying to move away from that or at least to use um, complementary measurements, but there's still a, a lot of work before they're abandoned. I don't think they're going to be ever. Um, okay, a quick word about um, possible paths for the future. I think that the community of PFT algorithm developers is being, getting more and more aware that we need to develop more interactions with the people who are actually going to use their output products, okay? So for example, as I was mentioning that uh, PFT user guide that's really designed to facilitate the selection of algorithm by the users and maybe to it, it does some work in uh, digesting all the information from all this paper so it's easier to uh, select the good algorithm to understand is its um, uh, strengths and weaknesses and it will it should help the user to apply it in a robust way like for example not applying an open ocean algorithm to case two waters which is very common unfortunately um, another question that really the community is starting to ask herself is do we produce what is actually needed by the users that's a tricky question because if you think about it the answer may be well it depends on the user for example, if I go and talk to Stephanie, she, if I go and talk to biogeochemical modeler, um, they will require global field, maybe monthly resolution of uh, diatom, strichodesmium, coccolithophore, picophytoplankton, maybe some other stuff. And none of the algorithm can really produce that. Um, if I work with uh, someone in the field of what quality uh, that research scientist may need, um, I don't know, like uh, one kilometer resolution of presence absence or uh, of uh, Carinia brevis in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so totally different product. But the approach are in a way similar. These are all PFT algorithms. Okay, so lots of a lot more interactions are needed between users and developers. There's also uh, some efforts conducted recently by the user, and particularly by the modeler's community, as to, um, there's been attempt to incorporate optics in biogeochemical models so that the output product will get similar, even identical, to some output product from algorithms based on ocean color observations, so that the comparison between model bio geochemical model outputs and pft uh, outputs pft algorithm output would be really identical and easy to do i'd like to draw your attention on uh, upcoming workshop in italy in september 
the in the interesting thing about this workshop is that it's going to deal with several ocean color derived products relevant to biogeochemistry. And for each session, there's go going to be uh, two lectures given by someone from the developer community and someone from the user modelers community. So hopefully there'll be a nice exchange about that. And there's a, a, PFT, a session dedicated to PFT. Okay. Uh, the final thing I'd like to talk to you about is the hyperspectral approaches to phytoplankton functional types. So we've mentioned this spectral based approach, in particularly the phytoplankton absorption based approach. You've seen that it's very attractive, in particular because of their mechanistic underpinning, the fact that there is a, di a direct link between PFT composition and optical properties. But the, the potential of such approach may have been somewhat limited by the reduced um, number of wavelengths ava available on past and current ocean color sensors. But with upcoming hyperspectral ocean color missions, there is a renewed interest, or an increase in interest, in uh, exploring the potential of an hyperspectral approach to phytoplankton diversity. Meaning, okay, if I have hyperspectral optical measurements, what can I do with that? How can I interpret them? How far can I go in their interpretation into, into PFTs? Um, okay, so in recent years, multiple studies have been published, some of them using relatively, um, I mean, not old concept, but uh, ideas published a while ago. Various methods to discriminate either pigments, uh, species, taxonomic groups, size class, using a, a large variety of methods. For example, uh, statistical methods such as EOF decomposition, uh, decomposition of absorption spectra into uh, the absorption by the different pigments or by into the absorption by different phytoplankton groups. Um, derivative analysis, basically this means that you take a spectra, you calculate either the second or the fourth derivative, and you look at the spectral feature and try to assign that to um, to, to change in the community <coughs> composition. And also ocean color inversion model, which you may have seen a little with Colin, I think. Okay. Some of these study have incorporated very nice uh, sensitivity analysis of the, um, and try to estimate really what would be the benefits of using hyperspectral optical data compared to multispectral optical data to retrieve information on PFT. So I'd like, just like, would like to show you um, a few graphs. So these are absorption spectra normalized, um, specific to different phytoplankton taxon. And they've been used in uh, modeling to simulate different reflectance spectra which you have here. So here and here you're looking at the change in the reflectant, in the shape of the reflectant spectra with uh, changes in chlorophyll concentration. So as we've seen, most of the variability of this is due to chlorophyll, change in chlorophyll concentration. And here you're looking at the, the change of the um, reflectance spectra uh, caused by change in the um, populate in the composition of the phytoplankton population. And you definitely see very nice change, but only if you look at the small spectral features. Um, here, the dotted gray line represents the approximate position of the centers of the modis aqua wave vein. You definitely see that you won't be able to capture these if, you're with, if you work with multispectral uh, information. So, I mean, in this case, you can definitely visualize the changes because um, Colleen worked with very high concentration of one given phytoplankton taxa, so the changes are very obvious. But by doing multispectral, uh, we can probably resolve small change using uh, inversion method or method similar. Okay, so I will finish with this one, take a message. I'm sure you got this one. Phytoplankton diversity is critical. I can for phytoplankton diversity. Um, the, 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 the development of algorithm for uh, discriminating PFTs from a chocolate observation, super active, multiple existing algorithm. 
are available on the market, as you've seen, relying on different, very different assumption and underlying principle, very different pros and cons. So make sure you acknowledge that when you, if you have to, at some point, play with one of these approach. Um, the community is facing important challenges, such as um, trying to really take good habits in terms of evaluating error uncertainties and each, and each step of, the, of an algorithm, really putting error bars on that, um, identifying new strategies to improve the characterization of uh, PFTs in situ while they're, while dealing with in situ measurements, potentially improving the feed between what can be produced and what's actually needed by user by developing more interaction between the two communities. And finally, uh, with future hyperspectral ocean color missions, and also not only, I mean, this, the, um, these new papers using hyperspectral approaches are not only stimulated by upcoming uh, ocean column missions with hyperspectral resolution, they're also motivated by the recent implementation of hyperspectral sensors on um, in situ autonomous platforms. So that's another way of applying the, the, those uh, approaches. Okay, so very good potential for hyperspectral approaches to phytoplankton community composition, but still much work to be done to really determine and even quantify how much can be gained compared to what we could do using past and current ocean color sensors. Thank you. Questions? Do you have questions? Do you have a Which are the current satellites that, that have a ocean color? And, and which is the lifetime of this satellite? So, I mean, it's for sure that it will be always time series all over the world for, you know what I mean? I mean, when sea waves finished, yes. um, there was MODIS, there was some kind of overlap. Is, okay. is, is a kind of international agreement that it will be always? I think there will always be multi-spectral ocean color satellites. Actually, I don't know much about uh, yeah. the progr programmation of sensors. Do you know about that, David? Multi-spectral, uh, you know, if nothing really wrong happens and uh, the economy collapses and everything, you know, we have normally the next 30 years of, you know, observations from multi-spectral observation, in particular with the Sentinel uh, series of satellites. You have the various series in the US, which is a bit different, but uh, well, from that point of view, and there will be a number of other more punctual, maybe, uh, missions from the Japanese, with the well, there is, you know, some sort of good panorama for the next 20, at least, you know. Uh, hyperspectral is another uh, story, and, you know, there is the pace. When I, when I said upcoming, it's actually scheduled to be launched like in 2022, 23, something like that. So it's not tomorrow yeah, either. You know, there are other hyperspectral sensors that will be launched much before this, which are not a space fully dedicated to uh, ocean color. So they don't have necessarily all the specification that we ideally would like to have. But some of them might still be useful to start, you know, having a look for this problem and, uh, you know, having a feeling of, you know, how difficult it is to atmospherically, atmospherically correct hyperspectral observations and then, you know, all sorts of things like this. Limitations in terms of signal and what you can see. So there is this uh, NMAP German sensor, I think, which normally doesn't have the required signal to noise, for instance, to do this you know, in clear open ocean waters, but, you know, in some coastal areas or where you have high biomass that might be still feasible. So there is some hyperspectral mission that might be used before we have, you know, the idea of the new space in 2025. Yeah. I mean, I think it's worth noting that there are a lot of yeah. these sensors are going up and you can do a lot of algorithm development and testing and validation with them. I think the the other school of thought that you have to maintain is that you want to you want to maintain a climate quality data set mm -hmm. so that you do have traceability and you do have really well quantified uncertainties and very high signal to noise so that we can compare the measurements that we've been making since sea 
to continue on to see if we can evaluate how the ocean is changing and responding to climate change. But those are two very different missions mm -hmm. in terms of you know what we might as a community might want. And and we actually want both. We need to have a climate quality data set that we have from space. But that doesn't mean that if a satellite doesn't you know, have those specific capabilities to be part of that, it doesn't mean that it's not useful, that we can't learn something from it in its lifetime in terms of development of algorithms, testing of algorithms, you know, developing uncertainties. That So I mean, I think the point is really well taken. Like, just don't just be holding out for paste, because it was supposed to go up in 2019. <laughs> And that's just around the corner, and it's not going up in 2019. So, yeah. so it makes all sense to develop this application also for in-situ platforms. Mm -hmm. And also um, suborbital missions and you know, any sort of, sort of aircraft sensors. There's, just, there's a whole fleet, literally, of, of platforms that you can use for these types of assessments. Not enough people to analyze that data. Yeah. So get ready. <laughs> Do we have other questions? Hi, we have kind of, well, another comment I would like to make on this PFT thing. You know, um, because at, at some point you said, okay, these different methods use different principles. You know, one in the field, and okay, but then they all start from the same thing. It will start from the eight uh, value of uh, the spectral reflectance we have. So that's something you have to keep in mind as well, you know. Because sometimes, you know, as a community, we I have heard some comments from outside this community sometimes saying, okay, this guy they have eight spectral bands or eight independent information, and they claim that they derive 30 or 40 different products, and then we, you know. Uh, they don't know what they say, you know, and, and sometimes you hear this. So that, you know, to make this comment that, okay, there is a lot, obviously, of empiricism in these local relationships and uh, all sorts of things. So we have to be careful as well, I guess, not to oversell too much, you know, this potential for our PFTs and all sorts of uh, beautiful things, because sometimes, you know, that's, and then you realize, hmm, okay, that's maybe more difficult than we thought. And then the people to which you have promised something, like the modelers or others, <laughs> come back to you and say, ah, OK, what's going on? You know? So you know, there is a kind of a process at the moment which we have to be careful with, uh, because we have a lot of pressure to some extent from modelers or uh, you know, fisheries people and all sorts of people who really would like to have information on this PFT, because we told them that we would be able to produce some answers. So, you know, I think that uh, acknowledging limits of each, uh, of an algorithm when you use it is critical and also uh, moving towards systematically adding, er quantifying error at each step of the algorithm would be critical too. I think we, at least the community has, get, uh, has gotten awareness of that. So it's a first step. And I think you have to be very careful. If you have eight wavelengths, you can have eight unknowns. Right? But say you derive an absorption and you derive a backscattering, so there's two of your eight unknowns, and you might have six others. But then we also have products that look at the ratio of backscattering to absorption and tell us something about whether we have coccolids or we don't have coccolids. So that's yet another piece of information that isn't necessarily an unknown. So you're not so so maybe you're dividing 30 products, but you're not really dividing 30 products. You have eight unknowns, and then you're using relationships between those derive products to tell you something else. And I think that's what people don't understand. Yeah. And so you're not overselling, but you're using what empirically what you understand about you know phytoplankton that have very high backscattering are different from phytoplankton that have very low backscattering. And so I think we have to be careful about sort of mixing products with mixing number of wavelengths and number of notes. Hmm. So. Well I mean I was making this comment because you know when I started in the ocean color things that was when for instance, Meris was launched and others. And a lot was promised on, we are going to do beautiful things in case to coastal water. And 20 years later, hmm, well, <laughs> we're still not doing so well. And you know, we just have to be careful not to make the same mistake to some extent with the PFCs. And, you know, yeah. yes. 
it's difficult. That's yes, it is. But I think, well, I, I mean, with this work on the three different papers, I, my um, aim was really to um, try to have you um, make think critically about those approaches rather than just acknowledging what's written and okay, okay, they do this and that. And, wow, nice product. So I hope you, you got that part. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you again.